this episode of the Hockey IQ Podcast, we finish up our recap of the Columbus Hockey Coaches Summit 2021. Really excited. We get uh, Matt Cook and John Kara on. Matt Cook goes over character development through the different age groups. And then John is going to deep dive into skating. We've had him on the podcast before, but uh, this one's really a nice deep dive into all the elements of skating. So I uh, would definitely suggest checking out our playlist on YouTube, which we'll have a link in the show notes. So don't want to waste another minute because this is nothing but good stuff. So let's get after it. Okay. Um, you know, once again, thanks to Greg Revac for letting me participate in this uh, program. Um, uh, a little bit of background, Matt Cook, Coach Cookie, uh, coached every level from uh, Mites through college. Um, but what I want to talk about today, the topic Greg gave is basically character development through hockey. And uh, I'm going to break this down into the four age groups, Mites through Bantam. Because in my mind, what makes hockey different from other sports, um, especially because you have a large percentage of the kids whose parents did not play the sport, is that we have an opportunity to have the kids take ownership of the sport. So let me go through each level uh, and talk about what I mean by ownership. Starting with the mites. Uh, you know, mites are going to have parents in the locker room helping them get dressed, and that's fine. But I want to be able to develop the mindset that the mite player is responsible for packing his own equipment back. So back when I had mites, I mean, we would take a little card, laminate it, put it on a string, hang it up wherever they stored their equipment, and had instructions that says, here's how to pack a hockey bag. Take your hockey pants, throw a shin pad in each leg, throw a hockey sock in each leg, throw in your cup and your garter belt, bang, now you've got the lower half done. And then proceed with that so that the child is responsible for packing their own equipment. Now, that's really about as much as you're going to get out of mites. Um, you know, and I will tell you that, you know, we had a situation where you know, if a kid forgot a piece of equipment, you know, he had to wear that card around his neck during practice. I'm not sure we can do something like that anymore. Um, but, you know, once again, it was a different time. But you want to have the players take ownership of just what's going to happen away from the rink. And one of the other things that I tried to do is towards the back end of the mite season, we would have a mite practice where no parents were in the locker room. So literally the coach and Coach Ez had to get there probably 45 to 50 minutes before practice. All the players got there and they dressed themselves. Now, you know, you're probably going to have to tighten skates a little bit, something along those lines. But once again, we want to get that mindset that the kid owns it, that it's his responsibility. And it's probably the first time athletically that an eight-year-old is going to be treated like an adult, that he's going to have that kind of responsibility. And if you can get the buy-in for that, now suddenly the kid's responsible not only for packing his own equipment, but you know for creating his shooting station at home, for creating a stick handling station at home. It, it, it's absolutely the right start. So you know, once again, it, it can be frustrating. And, and you, know, you say, well, I'm you know, here to do X's and O's. No. At the might level, you're not. At the might level, you're trying to help these kids become passionate about the sport. So then the transition that we make to the squirt level, uh, and you know, once again, you've got to have a parent meeting to get them to buy in on this. But once they're in squirts, as soon as that kid goes from the lobby to the area where the locker rooms are, it's his. Mom and dad stay in the lobby. So, you know, once again, as the squirt coach, yes, you're going to have to help kids get dressed, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to be able to, to create that environment where the switch goes from mom and dad running the show to the player running the show. And once again, you know, not everybody's going to buy, on, buy into this. You're going to have some pushback from parents. But I think it, it's just incredibly helpful for the kids to start to get that feel that it's theirs. And once again, if, if the kid believes it's theirs, you don't have to worry about motivation as much. Now, the tough one is when you make the transition from squirt to peewee. 
Um, you know, anybody who's coached Pee Wee will tell you it is the toughest age. Um, you know, in the old days, we'd say that, you know, the problem with Pee Wees is they're too young to hit and too old to intimidate. Um, and you know that the Pee Wees are going to screw up. But Pee Wees is the age where I try to let the players have the room, where the players dress without the coaches in the room. Now, it's never going to work perfectly all season. I mean, kids are going to start locker boxing or, or, you know, whatever it is that Pee Wees do. But it's important that the parents understand where you're going with this. Let the parents know that at some point, those kids are going to screw up being in the locker room by themselves, and the coach is going to take the locker room away from them. And if you really want to motivate kids, tell them that they're not worthy of a locker room, make them dress out in the tunnel. That will bring the lesson home, you know, not only the discipline of being able to have your own room, but the discipline that's required in our sport. But the parents need to know that, yes, this is going to happen. Now, obviously, you want to create a safe environment, and not every Pee Wee team can be trusted to have their own room. But I do believe you should give them a chance. So, and then the last area I want to go to is Bantam. And, and this is where, you know, the C on the sweater means more than just the coach's kid. I mean, this is where you get to the why. If you're talking about why you're doing certain drills with mite squirts and peewees, that's probably a waste of time. Once you're at the Bantam level and you can bring the captains in and say, okay, here's what I'm looking at as a practice plan. Are there any areas that you think we need to focus? Are there any particular skills that you think we need to develop? Um, you know, have a different kid on the team pick what game you're going to play at the end. But once again, you want to put the responsibility onto the captains, which bleeds down to the players. And is it the most efficient way to do things? I mean, absolutely not. And are they going to make some dumb decisions? Uh, yeah, of course they are. But once again, it's their decision. And, it, you know, it's not as if they say, I want to do A, and if I want to do B, we're still going to do B. But I want to hear why they want to do A. And once again, if the kids feel that ownership, that's where I think we make a leap in development, especially character development in hockey that we don't make in other sports. So Greg, I hope that came in on, under time here, but um, you know, give me the questions that you have that you wanna flesh out different areas. I think we should uh, continue to go up the chain here. Let's maybe talk beyond Bantam. Obviously, you're doing college now, and you've had some kids who recently went through high school and are into college. So maybe just a little bit into that. I know we don't want to dip too far um, and go too deep on that, but I'll, I'll get some follow-up questions beyond that. Yeah, and here's the problem. Once you get to high school, you're talking about an adult whose job it is to coach that team. And, and if he loses too many games, he loses a job. I mean, and, and that's... And that's the difference between youth and high school. And it's really tough. And, and that's the reason that I hated high school. You know, I, I never got, it was never my livelihood to coach high school. But, you know, you have too many screw ups and next thing you know, you're fired. You know, and it doesn't matter if you have, you know, 15 boneheads on the team, you're the guy who's going to get axed. So it's, it's really I mean, that dark area is high school, and I understand, or in juniors, and I understand why high school and junior coaches don't want to give kids that opportunity because their livelihoods are at stake. And, and, you know, even when you're at a triple A level, say, you know, you're getting paid, you know, 10 grand to coach a, uh, you know, U18 team, it's tough. It, it, it's really a very dangerous thing if the parents don't understand the objective. If the parents think it's about wins and losses while you're trying to develop character and ownership and responsibility, it's not going to end well. So that's why I think that most high school, that's why I think a lot of high school coaches tend to micromanage and especially junior coaches try to micromanage. 
So well, I, I think that there's an underlying piece here and, and you've talked about it is getting parents on board. So maybe you explain what you mean by that and how you kind of go about getting parents on board. All right, start with the might level. And, and this is the killer thing a parent could say in our sport. Tommy, if you score a goal, I'm gonna give you 20 bucks. I mean, that is a death sentence for development of a team. And, you know, I, I don't fault the parents, especially parents who don't know the sports. And, you know, look, you know, my dad used to say, if you want to get a ride home, get your name on the score sheet. You can have a goal and assist or a penalty. Just, you know, get on the score sheet. But there's that mentality, especially in a sport that attracts relatively wealthy parents, that a financial bribe uh, is what they think is the way to encourage and it, and you and I both know that it's 180 degrees wrong. You know, it, uh, so trying to find that way to talk to parents and look, you're not going to win every battle with parents. You know, it, it's the standard joke in our job that the greatest job in hockey is coaching an orphanage. Um, but you got to try. You got to try to get the parents to embrace Here's how the game is played. Here's what we're trying to do. You know, here's why being able to make that great, you know, bust up a two-on-one is way more important. Here's why it is a cardinal sin to take a penalty in the offensive zone. Um, but it's really, really tough because you've got to bring the parents along and raise their hockey IQ. And to start that with someone in their 30s, who hasn't played the sport, man, that's tough. And, and, you know, I wish I had more answers on that. But it, it, it comes back, you know, once again to letting parents know what the responsibilities are at each level. You know, mites are development for squirts. Squirts are development for peewees. Peewees are trying to win. But you're also trying to develop the bottom part of your roster without – crippling the top of your roster. I, I hope that makes sense. It does. And uh, since we're talking about ownership, character development, ownership development of the sport, uh, I think it's only fair that we talk about uh, the University of Akron and the Life U program that you've put together there. I think this just ties in exactly with what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and you can only get that when kids realize that they're at the top of their pyramid. So now you're at the point where they recognize that the stuff that happens off the ice is way more important than what happens on the ice. Um, you know, it, it's one of these things I've said, um, you know, when you ask me to write a recommendation letter for you for a job, the employer's not gonna care how many goals you scored. You know, the employer's gonna wanna know if you're punctual, if you're presentable, if you speak clearly, are, you know, can you handle a task? Um, can you handle criticism? Uh, you know, those are all the things that we can give in D2 College Club that are valuable to an employer. You know, it, it's not how many goals did you have on the power play. But the kids have to have that uh, sort of Santa Claus moment where, where they realize, okay, no, this, this is my terminal velocity. This is the last time I'm going to play uh, with a name on my sweater that's not some bar. You know, I, I'm not stuck in beer league for the rest of my life. This is the last time I get to represent uh, an institution, a school. So from a development standpoint, and, and we've done a pretty good job of letting them know what the expectations are before they get to Akron, but they understand that what we do with Life University, what we're doing off ice uh, is way more important than what we do during practice time. What do you feel is the most important? I'll talk on Life View after this and exactly what it is, but Life View itself, what do you think the most important thing is that either you do or the kids get from it or take away? Or is it, you know, one kid's taking notes and he now has to, you know, deal with the pressures of getting it to his teammates in a sensible way? Or, or maybe what are a few elements? It, it, it comes down to giving the kids a chance to fail. Um, letting them know they failed, 
letting them know what they can do to get better. So to me, life view, or I should say college club hockey is a way to recognize a mistake and grow from it. You know, and it's not the mistake of not getting the puck out of your own zone. It's the mistake of, Hey, you know, we were supposed to have the water bottles at the away game and you forgot them. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, those are the types of mistakes that we're trying to get through. Um, you know, a mistake of not dropping a class or not getting to a tutor or showing up late. Um, those are the mistakes that we want to acknowledge and learn from, um, you know, in that college phase. And, you know, it's amazing. And Greg, you can speak to this as well. The college years go by so quickly for the players. I mean, they're, they are absolutely at light speed as opposed to maybe the time they had in peewee. You know, so even though they're, you know, four or five years playing in the college level, it goes so quick. Um, and, and let me go back a, a little bit more back to youth hockey, especially once you hit the Bantam, because I, I had it written down and I didn't mention it. When you're talking to those uh, captains and say, okay, what do we need to work on? Where, you know, where, where do we need to get better? Now you're doing something that breaks what I think is killing USA hockey. You're getting from the mindset of saying we need to do flow drills versus we need to do skill development. And it, it's not that I think flow drills are terrible, but if you don't have the skill to execute the flow, it's a waste of ice time. Yeah, and in our barn, we're spending 350 bucks an hour for ice. So wasting $40 of it doing a 10-minute flow drill uh, is just criminal to me. But if the players understand, okay, we're going to work on this skill. And yeah, maybe it's stuff we were doing in sports and mites. But as we see us get better during this skill, then take that particular skill, move it into a small area game, then take that small area game and take it full ice. Now I think the players and the parents understand why skill development uh, is the most efficient use of ice time. And, and you could probably go on about Greg Rivak being a pain in your butt of why, why, why. And uh, that was a good way for him to start seeing the full picture. <laughs> there there might have been a little pushback at first. And, and this goes to something that, that coaches, and Greg, this is something I've talked to you about. If you have a really talented player who's a coach, sometimes they forget the struggle. And... and you know, not everybody has the same skill level. And there's a real good reason why you don't have Hall of Fame players winning Stanley Cups as coaches. You know, what the, the way you process something, the way that I know that if, if there was a skill you wanted, I had complete confidence that you're going to be in a stick handling station getting 10,000 reps and owning that skill. 10,000 correct reps and owning that skill. That's not everybody else. So, and, and that goes to a different point of how to structure a coaching staff, which would be a whole nother uh, lecture, but it, it would be, in my mind, it would be great to have, uh, you know, a top-down guy who's watching what the other coaches do, have a guy running the D zone, the O zone, the goaltenders, and then having someone like a Greg Revac who can go player by player pull them out of a drill and say, okay, here's how you're trying to do the skill. Why don't you try doing it this way? And, and if you can end up with a situation like that, I, I, I you will, the development will go at warp speed. But like I said, that's a separate lecture. Awesome. Well, wrapping this up, um, one, if you could uh, give us the mistake protocol and then two, if there's anything written down that uh, you may have, just missed over, uh, just with the flow of everything. We can circle back on that. But otherwise, I think uh, ending on those two items, mistake protocol and anything in your notes is, is a good way to end this. Yeah, the, the big one that, that's in the notes is start with why. You know, if I were to ask a coach, why are we doing this? I would get my head ripped off. I mean, that was the 70s. I mean, you, you just, you, you never dreamed of asking that. 
with this generation, which I think is a great generation, you have to give them the why. Okay, we're going to do drills A, B, and C, and here's why. And if you can get to the why, especially at a BAM or a high school level, I think it's very powerful. Um, as far as mistake pro protocol, you know, four-step process, acknowledge it. Oh, damn, I screwed up. Apologize for it. Sorry. Yeah, I could see where that was bad for the team. I don't want that to happen again. Learn from it. Next time in my, I'm at that decision, what are my other options? And then most importantly, drive on. Forget about that mistake and move on. This, this is a game of mistakes. It's too damn fast. You have different sizes. You have different speeds. You are going to have mistakes. And the, and the hard part is that what wasn't a mistake, what was a great play in mites, is a really stupid play in peewees. So the mistakes change over time. But the big thing that I want coaches to know, the, the big thing I would like coaches to embrace is don't try to prevent mistakes. Try to prevent the same mistake over and over. You know, nothing teaches like failure. And you don't have to embarrass a kid about this, but if you pull the kid aside and say the most important words any coach could say, here was the situation, what did you see? Okay, that's what you saw. What were your other options? Perhaps what could we do differently? Excellent. Well, thank you, Matt, for your time and your expertise here. Uh, there are plenty of other topics that we could dive into based off of that. Um, and I'm sure we will on the Hockey IQ podcast at some time. But thanks again for uh, presenting. I really appreciate it. So, Greg, once again, always a pleasure. Uh, and, you know, I got to keep saying – uh, you know, I told you six months ago, the hockey IQ is getting better and better, and it's still getting better and better. So, um, you know, uh, coaches, players, parents, uh, if you're not subscribed, uh, it, that is a mistake. You talk about an incredibly efficient use of time. Um, big fan of hockey IQ. That would be the hockey IQ newsletter, also the podcast. But yes, thank you, Matt. Really appreciate that. All right. Thanks, Greg. Awesome. Well, thanks, Greg. Um, so today, guys, uh, for my presentation, uh, what I'm going to try and take you guys through is um, a number of different examples that uh, for our group that we feel are uh, foundational keys for skating. Um, title of my presentation, I called it Power Principles of Skating. Um, and this is a presentation I've done before, but, uh, you know, there's a few new components that we've added into it uh, this time to go through. So, you know, it's always been my passion to, to, to help players with their development. For me as a player, uh, I struggle to be able to put um, the elements of my game to be together in a tactical setting. I um, was always a really strong skater, but, uh, you know, struggled at times to be able to put it, like I said, into a game setting and, and apply it, um, you know. And so for me, that's the biggest connection that I work to uh, create and our group works to create. Um, is to give that connection to players so they can understand, you know, how they can apply the skill in a game setting, um, you know, and how they can put all the pieces together um, to succeed. Um, and, and, and ultimately, we all want to succeed within the game setting. So for me, that's where my coaching philosophy came from. Um, obviously, had a ton of great mentors to learn from. But, um, yeah, really excited again to be presenting this uh, to you guys today. So let's jump right into it. Um, so power principles of skating, I've broken it down into three different elements. Uh, the first element we're going to touch on is glide. Second is flats. And then the third one is one that uh, Greg and I had talked about a little while ago in, in the form of decelerations. Um, so I love this slide. So I want to start with this. Um, I was working with a, another skills coach. Um, this would have been a number of years back. And uh, we were talking on the ice just about, you know, the differences between, you know, all the skills coaches that are out there. Um, and he said, you know, do you want to be a doctor or specialist? And so for me, I was kind of taken back by it. I was like, you know, what, what do you mean by that? And his biggest thing was that there's, you know, if you get a cold, you go to your, you know, walk-in clinic, you can see any doctor when you're there. But if you really need you know, if you need something that's specific to a certain area of your body, you're sent to a specialist. 
Uh, it's the same thing for us on the skill side. So there's, an, there's a number of coaches out there um, that are coaching the game and do a great job of it. But what, for us, what we really feel separates us that when someone needs something specific or a specific area of their game that they need to focus on, that's where players will come to us. And so that's where we try to separate ourselves as specialists. And the way we do that is we look at three different elements. So we look at analyzing a player, whether it's skating, shooting, puck control, game application. We start with the analysis. So watching them in game play, um, you know, is a big part. From there, we look to educate the player. So now how can we educate them in the different areas or the different skills that they can do or practice so that they can evolve their game? And then the last part is just prescribing. So now we're looking at elements that when they're away from us, what are things they can do? Could it be on ice? Could it be off ice? We want to share that with the family. We want to share that with the player. So now they have a plan of attack of how they can, you know, improve from that initial analysis, educating them and then sending them on their way. So today, my goal in this presentation is to take all of you guys from being those doctors and turning into specialists by identifying some of the key things that we use as a brand and as a company to identify things for players, to lead them to that point where now they can succeed and apply it in a tactical setting. So let's jump into it. So the first thing we're gonna do is, is analysis. And for us, when we look at analyzing players, especially when it comes to skating, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna analyze right towards their skate. So if players are having issues with something, that's our starting point. What we wanna look at is being able to break that down for you. We're gonna look at the hollow of skates. We're gonna talk about profile. We're gonna talk about a variety of different options for steel. And I'm also gonna to touch on ankle flexion, which is a big, uh, a big aspect for us when it comes to skating. So to start with, with hollows, basically what I want to go through with uh, the group today is just having an understanding of what's out there. Um, so if you look at the image on the left, uh, just having an awareness of the fact that there's, uh, you know, one radius profile, two radius, three and a quad radius. Um, your most common that you're going to see in a player is the two radius profile with a combination of that nine, uh, nine, ten. Um, that's a basic starting point for a lot of uh, sharpeners and a lot of players when you look at getting um, a hollow put on your skate or a profile, sorry, when you're getting that profile, most uh, most sharpeners are going to be looking at providing the two radius profile. But again, very important for you to understand um, the different setups that you can have with regards to that profile. Um, and profiles, again, are specific at times to a player's weight, um, a player's position, um, how they skate uh, on the ice. You can play around with a player's profile and have the ability to adjust, um, you know, their body position, their skating, where their weight is, the majority on their skates. So again, if you've got a player that you're analyzing, our first step is to look at where that profile is set for them. A lot of players won't even know these options. So just having a good awareness of them, you can dive deeper into them, um, but just something for all of us, if we want to be a specialist to dive into. Second image on the right just touches on the radius and the hollow. So when you're far left, when you're looking at last bite, you've got one inch all the way across the far side at three eighths where we've got more bite, we're digging into the ice. Most players, again, again, again fall in that middle area. So you're gonna see players getting five eighths. For myself, I always played at five eighths hollow. Um, you'll see some guys going to the three quarters or even to a half. Uh, those are probably your most common ones that you're seeing in players right now. Obviously, as you move down the chart towards the five eighths to the half, you've got that more bite. So by that, the hollow is, is deeper. So now you're looking at your edges as digging in a little bit more. Um, an interesting example for this with, uh, with local sports team for us with the Winnipeg Jets, I've had the opportunity to, uh, you know, go for coffee with uh, some of the, uh, the people involved with their organization. And one day we're talking about the different hollows on their players and, and I was asked the question of, you know, who I thought had, you know, would be at, you know, an inch and a quarter uh, radius. Um, you know, the obvious answer at that time was Dustin Bufflin, just based on the weight uh, that he brings to the ice. So, you know, at, at an inch and a quarter, you're looking at a very flat hollow, but a heavier player. So he's digging into the ice. And I was asked, you know, who was the second player I thought of. And so, again, I'm thinking of heavier players. Um, you know, I'm looking at some of the defensemen we had at that time, Paul Postma, etc. Um, and the answer uh, was actually Josh Morrissey, you know, one of the lighter players, one of the more undersized, but a true testament to him with his skating ability and now watching him with the glide that he's able to produce with that lower hollow um, and also how efficient he is on his edges. 
Um, just a, you know, a real world example of obviously the, the higher weighted players are you're looking for that last bite because they're naturally going to dig in. But if you can encourage, you know, players to work towards having that last bite on their skates, it's going to improve their, their overall skating and glide phase, which we're going to touch on today. But it's also going to allow them to, you know, not have to put as much strain on their body. So we're always trying to find ways um, to help players so that obviously they can avoid injury. One way you can look at that is, is playing around with the hollow. So first aspect, we want to go over profile and hollow. Secondary to that is just having an understanding of all the different options that are out there um, when it comes to steel and holders. Um, so when we're looking at this image here, uh, you know, the most common uh, skate that's out there is our Bauer skate. They've got the LS2. Um, there's different degrees or different levels of the LS holders. So just be aware of that and the quality of steel increases as you're looking at those different uh, LS uh, options for steel as well as the height of the blade. And the reason the height of the blade is important because if you look at when a player's turning, the lower that steel is on their, on their skate, as soon as they're turning, you're going to see more players touching that inside part of the foot onto the ice or the outside part, that forefoot. And you're going to see players blowing a tire on turns or in situations where they're under pressure. So again, if we're analyzing a player's skating, we want to understand the steel. We want to understand the different options and the heights of steel and whether we can recommend a different option to them. Second to the LS is the step, probably the most common uh, used steel right now in the NHL and most preferred by a lot of NHL trainers and equipment managers, just based on the fact of the quality of the steel um, and also the ability for uh, that quality leads to now your ability to be able to hold that edge longer. So it avoids nicks and burrs um, and allows players, you know, to have less sharpenings, but also get through a full game instead of having to switch their steel out. The one beside it is a, it's called the Raman Edge. Uh, it's a steel based out of Finland. Um, the big thing for them is it's a thicker steel. So similar to the flare blade on the right, it's a thicker steel, which again, allows you to hold edges longer, allows you to you know, disperse your weight a little bit, allows you to have improved glide is what they claim. They also send it to you profiled and hollowed uh, specifically to you um, coming right from their plant. Uh, one of the knocks on that is is that they do uh, classify it as a, hol a higher quality steel, but some do question whether it is that higher quality. And then on the far right is a flare blade, which I'm sure many of you guys have heard of. The idea of the flare blade, again, is you've got your, your basic width at three meters, but expanding that to 4.5 meters at the bottom, which again, gives players that greater surface area. Uh, and again, will help them to improve uh, with edges, glide, because now you're dispersing that weight over that 4.5 meters as opposed to three. Um, you know, there are a number of players that are using it right now. Biggest knock on it is obviously as you move that steel up from sharpening, um, you know, and putting a hollow on it, you're going to start to see that 4.5 millimeters start to go down as it moves up, uh, which again, you know, then you're getting back right to that point of where you got the three um, millimeter height blade. So again, um, just being aware of the different options for players that are out there is extremely important to us as a group um, so that you can identify some of those keys. You know, if a player is struggling in certain areas, can I identify steel? Can I look at profile hollow? The last part I want to touch on here is just ankle flexion. Um, so, you know, a real key component for us when we talk about um, um, skating is just that ability to um, um, to have that ankle flexion. And a lot of times if you look at a skate boot, um, the way it's built is that players um, struggle to get that ankle flexion. So we're yelling at players all the time to bend their knees, but in a lot of cases for some of them, they don't have the flexibility uh, to be able to do it. So the images I have on the left here um, are just showing a, a real example of someone's foot inside a skate. Um, and you've got the eyelets coming up. And if you notice the area where our ankle flexes, we've got about two or three eyelets right above that. So anytime a player is going to try to bend or, or use that ankle flexion, they're going to be limited um, by that skate boot, especially if they're tying it to the top and they're, you know, pulling it as tight as they can, wrap and tape around it. Um, so if you do have a player that's struggling to create knee bend, it's important that you're able to have an understanding of where their ankle flexes and then be able to advise them, um, you know, on whether, you know, maybe they can go down one eyelet or, you know, could they go down two potentially. 
Um, and all of this is working towards increasing dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Um, massive aspects of skating uh, is the ability to be able to engage those edges. And that all comes from dorsi and plantar flexion. If ankle flexion is restricted, it's going to be very hard for players to achieve either of those, dorsi or plantar. Um, and it, again, it limits their ability to create force in the ice for skating, shooting and passing. Um, you're limiting the use of the calf muscle. Um, just simply by switching this up for players, you're going to notice that they're going to have certain areas of their body that are now going to be engaged and their calf muscles might be sore in certain cases um, just because they're now engaging them. So really important that you're able to identify and understand what that foot looks like in a skate boot and how you can help that player. Now there's going to be some players that are able to create that ankle flexion even with tying to the top of their uh, top eyelet. So that type of player, you're going to work at a different aspect with them. There might be something else in their game you can help them with. But for the players that are struggling to really create that knee bend or that knees over the toes, you want to be able to analyze that and you want to be able to look into that. How do you do it? So for us, it starts off the ice. So we've got three examples here. We've got one of our, uh, our coaches here from Testify uh, who played at University of Syracuse. Um, just showing us a real world example. So if you look at the image on the left, this is her just working at a squat position. You want them to get in a squat position with no skates on. You can see the angles that she's able to create here. And ultimately what we're looking for as we progress through here is increasing that ankle flexion and skates. So the middle option here, she's laced them as she normally would right to the top. And then in the third one here, she's down that one eyelid. Okay, and we can notice the difference here when we look at this is the angle that she's able to create. So right from here, whether it's ankle flexion at 75, we're able to notice that, that ability for her to be able to get down nice and low into that good skating position. And that's all from an adjustment in her skates. So again, we're becoming specialists today. If you've got a player that's looking more in this middle position here and you wanna get them more balanced, you could have the ability to suggest to them to go down that one or two eyelets. So just having an understanding of how we do that, we do it off ice. We find it to be a great way to show players and get them comfortable uh, understanding the difference that that can make. Um, so again, just respecting and understanding that each player is unique is what I want to establish today. Um, we've got a great working relationship with True. Uh, their skate factory is based out of Winnipeg. One of the things that we work with them on is just testing out different, uh, different options for players. The image on the bottom here on the bottom right shows you an example of the True Power Strap that they've developed. This is used to assist players. Instead of suggesting we want you to go down one or two eyelets right away, the idea of the true power strap is to help them, support them with that. So having a player, if you were to take a player and say, go down two eyelets, you're gonna notice right away that they're gonna struggle to be able to skate. So the idea of the true strap is that it's an elastic strap that's built uh, that players are able to put on and it allows them to feel that flexion, but it also allows them to be able to feel that support that we wanna have from our skate as well. So they're able to work themselves up to being able to take that off and they're also learning to engage the proper muscles, whether it's in their feet, their calf muscles, feeling that ankle flexion all through that comes from that ability to use that strap while having that support as well. So not just going uh, cold turkey and trying it, but having that support so that now they can build up and they can build the proper muscles and the strength uh, to be able to ski properly. So again, goal of this was to understand the restrictions on flexibility. We wanna look at that for both on and off ice. The last image I have here is just of Nikolai Ehlers. So again, you're looking at his lacing pattern. Um, you know, he wraps it around his ankles, but again, he's down that two eyelets. And obviously, you know, one of the fastest skaters on the Jets and one of the one of the top skaters in the NHL. So again, finding what works for each player. You're going to look at Eichel. You're going to see him lace his skates all the way to the top. You're going to look at McDavid. You know, he's down that one or two eyelets, and he's real loose on his skates when he's skating uh, with his uh, how he laces them. So. Really important to understand those. Again, we're analyzing. So we've got to look at, we talked about hollow. We talked about um, the different options that you can get from profiles. We talked about the lacing pattern and the ankle flexion. We talked about the different types of steel. So when you're analyzing a player, don't just look at body position, et cetera. Start by really diving in their skates. And you do that by having a good understanding of all these different elements. Okay, so the next part we're going to jump into is educating. We're going to look at all these different elements from a technical side as well as tactical. We're going to review glide. We're going to look at flats. 
and we're going to look at decelerations, all building on our analysis portion. So the first part we're going to look at is Glide. For us, Glide establishes energy, how you can save your energy, how you can maintain it, touches on stability uh, and agility. So your ability to have Glide, your ability to react from that Glide position um, instead of uh, you know, having to delay your reactions. So I'm going to go through a few different parts for it. For us, the technical keys for it is that glide equals efficiency. So when you're looking at skating, glide is all about how, if you want to improve a player's efficiency in their skating, there's got to be an element of glide that they've got to work at. We want to have both edges on the ice. So we're not looking at sitting on the inside or the outside. We've got both on the ice. We want to maintain speed. We want to look at balancing on one foot. We're going to look at chin, knee, toe. That's how our alignment is. So getting players balanced on one foot with chin, knee, toe. For us with knee bend, what we talk about is pushing the knees over the toes. So this again comes back to that ankle flexion. If players aren't able to push those knees over their toes, you might have to reset them back and find a different way to get them to that position. Last part is obviously the balance and stability that we touched on. From a tactical standpoint, where are you gonna see glide? You're gonna see it in forwards and backwards skating and stride, which I'm gonna focus on today. You're gonna to see it in puck protection. You're gonna see it reading plays in that reactive state. You're gonna see it for shooting off single leg. You're gonna see it for passing. You're gonna see it for puck control. So you're gonna see it in basically every element of the game. I'm gonna start off with two examples. So we like to start off with game applications so that we can see it. This first one here, we're gonna watch McDavid. So this is just uh, off a puck race from a couple of years ago. What we like to look at is obviously the main player we're focusing on, but also the players that are now off of him. So we're gonna look at Furland here and you're gonna see Brody come into the screen here as well. What I want you to notice is how he's able to pull away. And obviously we're using one of the best skaters in the game, but a big portion for him is his ability to have that glide and get into his glide phase. So right from this angle, what I want you to notice is how he's his glide phase. So how he's able to recover his one foot back under his body. And with that simple glide phase of his stride, how he's able to push and glide and take away his speed and pull away from other players. And if we look at the other guys in their glide phase now, if we go back, so we've got Furland in the back here, we're gonna see Brody, who's probably about 10 feet away from McDavid, have to also get in that phase. But if we look at here, the recovery phase for Furland, his skates are coming in outside his shoulder. McDavid's getting all the way back underneath his body and getting that good chin, knee, toe with his stride. So from here, we look at Furland's stride. We're gonna see Brody come into the picture here as well. If you notice the glide phase on both those players is very limited. And for us, that's why McDavid is one of the best skaters in the game is based off his glide phase. And a lot of that comes from his recovery. The next example that I'm gonna show you guys here, just jumping ahead on this next one, we're gonna watch the players off the rush again as well. So we've got McDavid here. I want you to notice his phase as he enters and he's gonna use a bit of a deceleration at the end, which we're gonna to touch on in a bit. But I want you to also notice Perot, how he enters and comes in. So from here, look at McDavid into a glide phase. Even in his glide phase, he's still pulling away. So I know Perot is trying to close that gap, but watch within the glide phase where his feet are, his feet are under his shoulders. We've got Perot still skating and not really closing that gap. McDavid continues to pull away as he's taking off. For us, it's all about how he maintains his speed. And this isn't worked on enough as players get older, is how do they maintain speed in this glide phase? He's got both edges on the ice, then he can decelerate, but it allows him to maintain his speed and pull away from other players on the ice. So it's a massive aspect to us when we look at McDavid and, and some of those best players. Now, how do we teach it? So for us, real simple, two foot basic hockey stance. I know we teach this at the youngest ages, but as players get older, we start to neglect it and move away from it. But for us, it's a foundational skill. And it's about getting players into that position where both skates are on the ice. They're not hugging the outside edge. If you notice here, we're getting that ankle flexion with the knees over the toes. We've got both skates on the body or underneath the body. And that allows us to maintain both those edges on the ice in a good position. And you'll notice when players do this, they should be able to take a number of strides and be able to maintain their speed. At some point as we're moving down the ice, when we're skating, if we keep our skates going the whole time, if we can get in this glide phase, it allows us now to be able to be in a position where we can react, in a position where we can maintain speed and also allows us to increase our efficiency. And, and, and we all are looking for efficiency where we have more energy to react. That's where this glide phase comes in. From there, you wanna challenge players to work on one foot. 
Okay, so this again, huge aspect when players are looking at forwards or backwards skating is that ability to maintain speed on that glide leg or that support leg. And that all comes from this chin knee toe position. Okay, that allows us to be able to keep that. So I'm just gonna jump ahead on this one so we can see it from a side view. So again, you're challenging players, knees over toes. Okay, getting into that good position, upper body, good positioning. But again, it's all about getting onto this support leg in that good position as they work down the ice. So real basic skills here, but something at every level that players should continue to work at. And they're gonna notice a big difference in their skating when they do it. From here, we wanna challenge players to add in hops. And you'll notice even within this example for me, a real tough skill here. But as I come down, you're gonna notice my left foot, how it rides onto that outside edge. Okay, again, you get a player to do that again. You wanna see them landing right in that good position, right on their flats and not allowing that foot to drop out like mine does within this. So it starts again when they come up, they're loading knees over toes. And then as they come to land, we wanna see them land back in that good position, absorbing. And again, this is gonna increase knee bend, uh, but we're coming back. If a player can't do this, we gotta be able to analyze and look at that ankle flexion, et cetera. Okay, after this, we're looking at now going back to the single leg, and this is a real challenging drill, but working through that single leg, being again, able to land on the flats, you're gonna notice again with my skate, it moves. You wanna get that player to a position where they're able to land that, and they're able to be nice and stable in that position. So limiting the movement in that blade as they land, coming up, chin, knee, toe, nice and balanced, and being able to land back on the flats. Okay, the last part is just implementing it into a stride now. So being able to keep that chin, knee, toe, you're gonna to notice that nice solid position, implementing it with a stride. Um, for us is a huge factor is a lot of players can do it as we're moving up the ice, but now building it up once they're confident with it, add in your stride, add in some arm swing and look for them to be stable. And this glide phase is gonna make a huge difference for players because it's gonna allow them now to be able to maintain that speed and get to a certain point where now they can react and be more in that reactive state. So this would be educating players on glide, okay? And getting them comfortable with that. The second phase of our, our pro presentation today that we wanna go through with you guys is the flats. So getting players to understand the flats. For, for us with flats, it's all about getting them comfortable with weight awareness is the weight in the toes or the heels and also being able to control that friction. All too often we talk to players about digging in hard into the ice. For us, it's about controlling that. How can we control that friction and how does it help us? So the first thing we're gonna talk about for technical keys with the flats is understanding the different areas of the blade. So for us, we talk about three different areas. You'll also hear people talk about the four different areas of the blade. For us, it's three areas. We've got the toe, the middle, and the heel, the skate. And we wanna get players comfortable when they're on their flats of how they can find that middle area of two by unweighting to one, unweighting to three, and just being able to control that friction that they have on the ice. So identifying the key areas of the blades, awareness of the weight on the skates, understanding the edges inside, outside, and also controlling the friction as I touched on just with the ice. How do we control that? We don't wanna get right on that edge and dig in. We wanna be able to ride in those flats where we can control our speed and control our pace. Um, so I'm gonna to jump to just a couple of video, or examples here. So tactically, we talk about punch and jam turns toe turns off puck recoveries where guys are coming back, they got both turns, uh, skates turning, and obviously stopping, coming in, being able to stop, and then through transition. So maintaining speed through transitions. A lot of teams at NHL levels and, and, and major junior levels are talking about eliminating the crossover. So for us with transitions, again, we wanna get players comfortable using the flats to maintain speed as they come through. So the punch and the jam are probably the, the, the biggest buzzwords that are going around right now when it comes to, uh, to skating and tight turns. And there's a, there's a number of people teaching it, but I just want to go over it here from the use of a flat portion. So if you'll notice how he engages the you know, flats of the skates, he's controlling his friction, which allows him to use it almost as a rudder to be able to find this open ice and then be able to release his shot on net. Okay, so this is one example of how you use it in a game. He's not digging in super hard. He finds those flats. Instead of getting right on the edge where he's turning, he's able to find that flat area. Working up the boards, you're gonna see it right here in this next example. So right from here, you're gonna see him punch with that left foot. Okay, again, controlling the friction, maintain speed with the back foot, and he's able to create that separation on Shafley. So I'll bring it back just one more time so we can see it. 
Okay, the punch or the jam here right at the top, engaging that left foot, back foot keeps motion and he's able to accelerate to the net. So two examples of how we can use those flats instead of getting right on the edge, um, using that flat to be able to create some space for uh, themselves for both players. Okay, so from here, we're gonna jump now into how we identify and how we get players working through the flats. So for us, a lot of times when we taught this at first, we did it where we had players just doing it straight up the ice. So they didn't have any partner support and a lot of players struggled with it. So we started to try to find ways to implement that. And one of the ways we did that was just with partner support. And the other element that we found within this is it allowed partners to give feedback to players. So how was the friction they were creating on the ice? Was it creating a lot of friction where they had a ton of resistance as they were dragging them? Or was it limited? Did they feel differences with their friction? So it created that dialogue between players as well. Tactical applications for these. So I'm just gonna jump through these. So tactical applications, I'm gonna show you two different examples. These are both set off puck recoveries from the corner, but now adding in that resistance of having a partner, having the puck in a protected position and being able to use that jam to be able to fake, get the partner to bite, good stance, use the flat on both skates and then being able to drive to the middle. Okay, so again, within this example, we're looking to engage both feet. But again, if we're coming in and we're digging that edge into the ice too hard, it's gonna be real tough for us to be able to accelerate and maintain our speed. So this is where we're looking to find flats and get players comfortable engaging those edges as they come through. Uh, the last part here that I wanna to touch on is just deceleration. So creating and taking ice, you're gonna see decelerations used in situations of puck recoveries where players are going back to recover pucks and they wanna close that gap on their pressure to make it harder for the pressure to react. You're also gonna see players using it off zone entry. So as they come into a zone entry, how can they drive defenders back and be able to control their pace? So those defenders now have to transition up on them in an in a control, awkward position. And now they're able to react off of that pressure and control it a little bit more. So we're going to look at it from a creating and taking ice perspective. Like I said, where you're going to see de decelerations from a tactical standpoint is zone entries. You're going to see guys use it on breakaways to drive goaltenders back. And you're also going to see it off puck recoveries. The last part, and I touched on this a ton today, is every player provides different skating variations. We touched on McDavid and Eichel, but there's thousands of examples out there. So for us, when you look at McDavid and you look at Eichel, two very different skaters, but two very efficient skaters. So McDavid, we talk about him being dominant velocity-based qualities, whereas Eichel is more dominant force-based qualities. So if you're looking at both players, McDavid with velocity, he's in that glide position a lot. His, his strides are not super long, whereas you're looking at Eichel, he's, he's generating as much force as he can from the ice just with that length of the strides, very powerful, long strides. Um, so each player is different. So how are you now as a specialist going to teach those players? How are you going to break it down for them? Um, you know, is there something you can do with lacing patterns, something you can do with hollow, something you can do with profile? Okay, once you're past that, how do you now start to teach them? But you've got to start off by analyzing those players and understanding um, the differences they provide. And you guys are going to have probably a hundred examples of all the different players that you guys work with. But for us as specialists, it's important that we're prepared with those elements, those different varieties, those ways we can get players to feel that because uh, each player is unique and different. Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, especially Greg, thank you for having me on. Um, if you guys do have questions outside of uh, after reviewing this recording, please don't hesitate to reach out. My email's at the bottom here. Um, I'd love to hear from uh, from any of you. Um, and Greg, love what you're doing. I think, uh, you know, bringing, you know, people together and, and sharing ideas is going to make a huge impact and, and a huge opportunity for uh, for coaches in the Columbus area. So thank you again for, for having myself and our group on. Um, and hopefully there's some takeaways from today that uh, everybody can have. So I went uh, went a little long, but, but uh, thank you guys very much. And, and hopefully... Hope to see all you guys uh, on the ice and, and, and working again here uh, sooner than later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. So before we let you go, though, we'd like to remind you to please like our podcast, subscribe to it, give us a follow, uh, and share this with 
all the hockey people in your life. We really appreciate uh, growing this community, this podcast. Um, remember, we also have a newsletter, the Hockey IQ newsletter as well. Really excited to continue to grow this. So please help us grow this further by liking, subscribing, following, and sharing uh, with everyone. So appreciate you all. Take care.